Okay, border ontologies, geopolitical transpositions, and the visual I've added on to that, just because I noticed yesterday a lot of the papers um, which were fascinating were kind of more social science maybe and political science based. So I just, today they seem to have been a bit more towards the visual, so I just wanted to kind of add that on that I'm more coming at it from a, a visual culture or a cultural studies um, background. The word ontology is used often, perhaps lightly, within discussions of visual culture and social science. Borrowed from philosophy, its significance to analyses of the visual is pertinent because the ways in which a work of art exists meaningfully will vary from one observer to another. Art, since it's moved towards the dematerial and the conceptual or the participatory, has become existentially fluid in itself. We look towards the ontology of things and their associated language systems in order to make sense of them or to contest them. Borders as things, as creative interpretations or as concepts, are an easy platform for provocative conceptualisation here. In this paper, I will consider what borders are, how they carry or transpose ideologies, and drawing from varied um, geographical visual examples, why they have been of relevance to geopolitical visual culture projects in recent years. I will suggest um, that often binary constructs work against us, but they can work for us in a visual sense where they can be operationalised and transposed as a form of critique of the binary itself through a kind of visual shorthand. And additionally, visual cultures about borders can work in other more performative or socially engaged ways to work against the border. The existence of borders and the questioning of what they entail, familiar to the interdisciplinary field of, of so-called border studies, provides fruitful discussion of how and why they have been so frequently visualised within artistic practices of late. Border studies theories such as Donnan and Wilson in 2012 have described a growing awareness of border events, circumstances in the late 20th and 21st centuries, which have instigated a growing awareness around the presence or absence of borders. Such events include growing refugee camps on international scale, 9-11 and the so-called war on terror, as, as the Bush administration called it, digitalisation and globalisation, and the spread of diseases such as SARS and Ebola, all of which have been major media spectacles. Borders often cannot contain risk, and the spread of danger from one state to another. Even if they can, which or whose hazards are they preventing from crossing the border, or which states are worthy of blocking such dangers only to keep them contained in others? Can we belong in a safe state in a world of multifarious states containing varying degrees of endangerment or precarity. As Vaughan and Williams suggest, quote, at the airport one's citizenship or refugee status becomes suddenly, suddenly apparent and the mask of hegemony slips. The belonging that so many assume to be inherent or at least reliable comes to be interrogated and put into radical questions. Borders can be seen as a material entity with its own apparatus, such as a, a fence, a river, or a watchtower, an interrogation room, a scanning system, a patrol person, a wall or a gate. And it can also, or they can also be conceptualised as a signifier of geographical boundary, the container of citizenship or national identity, or the expeditor of diasporic struggle or refuge. How do borders see themselves? The biological order of the border has been addressed by artists in recent years, where in some artworks the border apparatus has been visualised, reproduced and or mimicked. Examples include Castlefield Gallery, which is in Manchester, um, did an exhibition called Life in the UK, Balance of Probabilities, where a fake interactive visa application centre um, was installed by artists from Turkey, Osman Bozkurt and Didem Ozbek as part of Asia Triennial Manchester 2011. And that one um, is here. So we went into the gallery, it was kind of mimicking what it's like to go through customs and then you had to sit um, a UK citizenship test based on real questions. There's also been another example, Zhijing Men's Welcome to Zhijing, a 
fictional city where border rules are decided by children. And that's pictured in the left, and that was at um, the Guangzhou Biennial in Korea in 2012. And also, Taiwanese artist Chen Chia Ren's um, Empire Borders film, which reenacts real tales of Taiwanese immigration, and which was shown at the Venice Biennale in 2009. Such pieces work well at art biennials, as these international global cultural mega events um, require artists, curators, and visitors to casually cross physical and cultural borders in order to see art. These artworks contest the border and its relationship to sovereign states with, a, with sardonic allusion. They highlight the performativity of the border through its artificial construction. As a visual signifier, as a motif, a border can be drawn as a line. It divides one thing from the other, a painting from the wall, the written word from the margin, or a homeland from a foreign land. In this sense, it represents binaries, here and there, home and away, and so on. The line of area between these binaries has been described as a state of in-betweenness or liminality or interstitiality, or relevantly, a state of exception, as suggested by Agamben in Homo Saka, in relation to the bare human rights of refugees who have no protection by or democratic vote in relation to the sovereign state, according to Agamben. This week, the, the UN Refugee Agency provided the statistic that one in every 130 people on the planet are forcibly displaced. And considering the gripes of Brexiters, only 6% of these people are actually hosted by European countries. A significant proportion of the globe are then living without basic human rights or conditions in or near border regions, or from within, but also beyond the borders that mo most of us take for granted, in terms of their ability to designate legal citizenship. Borders, borderlands, and borderlessness then also become a point of existential and biopolitical interest for political and social scientists and artists alike. For artists, the use of visible borders within compositions delineates not just the physical actuality of border presence, but also the compromised ways in which the border sees. Its practical implications compromise human agency and ways of being or of not being. The border is a mechanism interacts, to borrow from um, Barad, with the crossers of the border. Humans, apparatus and lands come together to create the reality of borderness. And this is similar to how Rogoff describes um, contemporary geography also as Actually, that one's not in there. Um, quote, an alternative set of rela relations between subjects and places. Claire, in 2003, also locates the concept of geopolitics within the late 19th and early 20th century imperialistic conquests over territory, where the geographical was always subjected to the politics of state ownership and competition. Just go back to that one. With the more powerful sovereignties scrabbling to reap the rewards of other lands. One of the reasons why the geographical becomes political is because different topographies harbour valuable raw materials, not to mention the human skill sets required to extract and harvest them. Paradoxically, heterogeneity of geography encourages a kind of homogeneity of governments, where the homogenizer, as in the imperialiser, considers themselves to be more powerful and more worthy and they take over this land and its resources. Dictionary definitions of politics highlight the relevance of power and governments within systems, world or otherwise. So the portmanteau geopolitics then suggests that geography, or earth description, if you look at the kind of etymology of the word, becomes entwined within strategies of power making. Claire, along with Dittmer and Sharp and other scholars, suggests that this imperialistic form of geopolitical endeavour culminated in the world wars. Um, and after that time, the word geopolitics disappeared because of its kind of association with fascism. But then the word geopolitics um, was reignited later in the 20th century um, amongst growing reflexivity or re reflectivity around the Cold Wars and its arguably similar philosophy of us and them. Then we had something called ge critical geopolitics, which became a later phase of the study of the geopolitical. 
post-Cold War, post-colonial, post-war on terror and post-structuralist influenced, considerations of geopolitics began to acknowledge the paradigmatic restrictions of seeking to understand the world purely in terms of big power struggles over territory. Interpretations of geography and politics are entangled within language and associated value systems that are complex, multiplex, and which have aimed in the post-structuralist period to be non-hierarchical or decentered. Part of this criticality of the concept of the geopolitical might also contest its implication of power relations or politics, which is often traced to the civilizations of the Hellenistic period. In the 21st century, Commentators from a variety of disciplines consider that we are living in the age of the Anthropocene, that while human agency has incurred detrimental environmental changes that have shaped the landscape as we now know it, at the same time, anthropocentric perspectives of evolution are limited. Matter matters. According to new materialists such as Bennett and Barrett, matter is vibrant and agental. It conjoins and influences human activity. Similarly, human bodies and place come together through border making and border understanding and through border crossing. So to return to Rogoff, it's not scientific knowledge or the national character categories of the state that determine both belonging and unbelonging, but rather link sets of political insights, memories, subjectivities, projections of phantasmatic desires and great long chains of sliding signifiers. The border can signify an ideology and it can transpose it to another kind of grand narrative which fits the same governmental requirement for a limitation. To transpose can mean to exchange as well as to move or to traverse, to go beyond. Borders are capable of transposing people as well as paradigms, swapping one national or political identity for another. Former Cold War borders have transposed to new ideological borders such as that of the war on terror, if we think about, for example, the division between North and South Korea, with North Korea kind of the last vestige of the Cold War, um, so it was always a, a, a sort of dominant Cold War narrative border, has now become more of a kind of post-9-11 um, former axis of evil border. So the border represents um, and transposes kind of systems of knowledge and understanding about the world, or it's utilised or operationalised in that way. The border is a limitation. It can be perceived as rigid. However, critics such as Deleuze, Parker, Salter and Vaughan Williams argue that in a globalised modern world, borders and their crossings are fluid and ephemeral, creating a seam between two states which adjoin and which can be crossed. Yet at the moment of crossing a border, its existence becomes apparent, as well as the sovereign or regional identity, or the lack thereof, of the border crosser. Salter suggests that borders then knit the world together, but also knit us as subjects into the bordered world. By crossing the border, we reify its existence, helping to perform the sovereign distinctiveness that it straddles. We unwittingly stitch the searcher ourselves, but we might also want to unpick it. The body that crosses a border is more readily fluid than the border itself, arguably. The border is bureaucratically established, and the border crosser is too, as a citizen of a state, if they are. But bodies through their own ontology are not stationary, whereas the physical line of the border is intended to be static for at least some period of time. Humans accomplish this over and above borders, we can perform upon their stage setting, even if we cannot always fully cross them. Um, so border performativity as a kind of overall concept, but also as something to think about in relation to art practice. How can artists board, um, perform borders and in so doing contest them? TJ Demis in The Migrant Image suggests that lens-based mediums that capture the appearance of difficult borders to which refugees are subject provide a border crossing by the active recording of their presence. The photographer pro provides a voice and an image um, capture for the migrant, a kind of precarious rite of passage, um, which arguably we saw in the film yesterday evening. We can also think about this kind of enactment significantly in relation to hard borders, and those that are marked in part um, by their militarisation. 
the green line between the Greek and Turkish sides of Cyprus, the police patrol checkpoints in Israel and Palestine, or the demilitarized zone between the two careers. Artistic practices which engage directly with these spaces unsettle their military purpose. They become a place worthy of art, not just a state of militarized exception. The Real DMZ is um, an annual project. Um, it's led by some Muso art space in Seoul in South Korea. Um, and it commissions artists to respond to an area of the DMZ, which is the demilitarized zone between North and South, and it's an area called Cherwon. Artists' works here inhabit observation tourist centres and moribond former North Korean buildings and infiltration tunnels, now belonging to the South Korean governed side of the DMZ. Artists know Suntag, and I'll just move forward to that. In 2012, explored the touristic and voyeuristic side of this non-inhabitable zone. He took photographs of tourists and soldiers looking from areas of the DMZ at areas beyond or within the DMZ. From the observatory building, you can watch a North Korean watchtower. If you walk the infiltration tunnel, you see the former walls carved by North Koreans and current tourists as they walk in front of you to reach the end, a kind of dark tourist reenactment of military pursuits. No asks, why do we want to perform such, such a border in this way? Why does the South Korean Tourist Association endorse it? The questions of his photograph raise... Um, The questions his photographs raised disrupt its presence peacefully. The energy of post-conflict and border control is transposed to the energy of creative mark making, not just that of restrained footsteps. It becomes about saying something new. Forms of um, formativity in artistic practice can be more explicit where borders are less subject to strict regulation, denoting historical boundaries of countries rather than of fully independent sovereign states such as those between England and Wales or Scotland, or even between nation states that have had um, peaceful bilateral relations. As with all performance, identity, or identity politics even, is inextricably present. Artist and researcher Paul Jones has described his artwork as performing the border. He, he is filmed as he stands, and you can kind of see him there talking to a passerby. He stands beside his... Um, English Welsh border between Flintshire and Cheshire um, on a place called Boundary Lane, which kind of cuts, um, cuts England from Wales, Flintshire from Chester. Um, and he says to passers by, Welcome to Wales, um, Croisco Gumry. The majority of members of the public don't know what he's saying and scuttle by feebly, demonstrating their lack of knowledge of Welsh cultural landscape while inadvertently becoming a character providing a role in a wider narrative about British imperialism or late capitalism, or the ontology of sovereignty and nationalism. The latter which has especially been in question in relation to the EU referendum debate. Jones's performances raise awareness about Welsh and British identity and the ways in which we discuss or avoid it within the so-called United Kingdom. This is not immediately precarious, but it does work to provoke an uncomfortable dialogue that is needed in relation to geopolitics in the world at, at large. Border performances are not always so literal, either as artistic practices and or as discourses. My recent research project into the visualisation of Chinese borders considered the geopolitical border between mainland China, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Hong Kong's mode of production is capitalist. The People's Republic of China is politically, though no longer economically, socialist or communist. Hong Kong considers itself to be democratic, though recent interference from Beijing by the government and media has compromised Hong Kong's rights to complete suffrage. Under the one country, two system structure, Hong Kong is a special administrative region rather than a fully independent state. Many Hong Kong residents desire independence from the mainland, as can be visualised in relation to the Occupy Central or Umbrella movement, where for the autumn months of 2014, thousands of residents donned with protest banners, yellow umbre umbrellas signifying a barricade against police tear casts, 
occupied the central areas, including around the administration's headquarters, and they were campaigning um, for a full democracy. There was also the Sunflower Movement, which was um, a similar movement that preceded it in Taiwan. Art activists Samson Wong and Jason Lam created um, Stand By You Add Oil Machine, a four-month project which lasted the duration of Occupy Central and projected thousands of messages of support via Twitter um, and other social media onto the government Lenin Wall, which also became um, plastered with um, post-it notes, which have now also become a symbol of the, of the movement. Wong and Lam described their premise on the not-for-profit cultural platform called Slout. We sought to con contemplate alternative ways to add oil to a political movement through new media and various global participatory mechanisms. In Cantonese, add oil means stay strong, and from childhood we all learn to tell each other to add oil and to add oil for each other. It is our hope that this emancipatory episode will add oil to the civic life of our city and global society more generally. More recently, Wong and Lam um, created a new projection called Countdown Machine, which is that one kind of in the middle, and um, that's very recent, um, onto the tallest building in Hong Kong, and it displayed digits counting down until the end of the One Country, Two Systems Agreement, um, which they have with the main lines. Um, so in 50 years from 1997, so 1947, um, it will be 50 years since the end of British colonial rule of Hong Kong and therefore also the end of the One Country, Two Systems Agreement. And that system has ensured the island at least some freedom from the mainland's political system. The countdown machine was swiftly censored by authorities and this has become an increasingly unfamiliar, um, a previously unfamiliar but increasing issue in the Hong Kong art scene. For these campaigners, some of which were artists and designers, the border between Hong Kong and China is actually too often crossed, and this border crossing represents not freedom of movement between states, but of the intrusion of one state into another. Unlike in the work of migrant artists addressed by TJ Demos and others, who see the border as a barrier or as an opening to a civil and democratic opportunity, or in the work that draws attention to the disambiguity disambiguity of hard borders such as the Korean DMZ. Here instead the border represents something piecemeal and half-hearted. The politics of this border for Taiwanese and Hong Kongese residents is increasingly becoming its ineffectiveness or its absence. This is also the case with Taiwan which, although not subject to the one country two system superstructure, is neither recognised as a sovereign state by United Nations. Also, in 2014, the mainland Chinese government intervened in Taiwanese politics by signing the Cross-Strait Service Trade Agreement with Taiwan, which enables China to use military force against Taiwan. Similarly, in Hong Kong, um, in 2014, changes were imposed to the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress electoral, framework, electoral Reform Framework, which limits universal suffrage now in the UK in the in Hong Kong, sorry, HK. What it means is that a nomination committee will elect two or three so-called China-loving candidates with more than 50% of their votes before the Hong Kong public can then vote for candidates. So they no longer have universal suffrage. The precursory protest movement to the Umbrella Movement is the student-led sunflower movement um, in Taiwan in 2014. So protests and particularly protests such as these which occupy um, significant urban territories and capital urban centres, is a kind of performance, an ideology made spectacle and made material. The barricades used by police to contest these protests, some of which were modified by protesters, seem to um, encapsulate inadvertently the desires of some um, in Hong Kong and Taiwan to be peacefully disbanded from the mainland. The publicness of such protests, the repetitive or innovative agitprop banners or projections um, such as show, um, such as add oil, has the potential to change political opinion and decision making. Protests are simultaneously active contestations and withdrawals from the superstructural every day. But they are, however, not easy to sustain.
Um, socially engaged art practices in Hong Kong and Taiwan have recently addressed border issues with the mainland. By instigating eco-projects around sustainability of the, of the land, on a geographical level, the land represents the nation, despite it not being a nation state in these cases of Taiwan and Hong Kong. And by working on and with the land, citizens arguably can strengthen its distinctiveness, particularly where local and or indigenous communities are involved within the project's sustenance. And examples of um, artwork that have worked on the land include um, Hong Kong's community museum projects, Pak Chai um, collaborated with local established farming communities in the disputed land of the North, northeastern New Territories near Moshi Po village, um, which is by the border of, of China, but the top of Hong Kong. And there's some videos searching for the village of happiness um, about this, this project. Their work involved taking photographs, documenting, um, farming the land, building native puts, drawing and making films of the contested space. In this territory that is next to the border with the mainland area of Guangdong, the Governmental Development Bureau have planned for new towns to be built to house central Hong Kong residents who cannot afford accommodation in the overcrowded city, and this will disrupt settled communities. Further, there are plans for um, a high-speed railway which will link Hong Kong to Beijing via Guangzhou. The border in the northeastern New Territories represents friction between mainland Chinese and Hong Kongese interests, but this line can also be viewed as embodying the contested border between the oral and the urban. This is something which is pertinent not just in terms of the rapidly developing late capitalism of the mainland or the neoliberal corporate developments of the compacted area of Hong Kong Island, but also to the mainland's internal migration system, which has been monitored by the state's application of the hukou system. Concerns have also been raised in Hong Kong and Taiwan regarding the number of Chinese migrants relocating to the islands to live and work, driving down wages and pushing up accommodation costs due to saturated cities, as well as the transplantation of Taiwanese factory work to places abroad, including China, which offer cheaper labour. Um, such issues were visualised in Taiwanese artist Chen Jiren's factory film and photographs, or in the pusher, a, a shipping container um, film installation which I curated at Asia Triennial Manchester, and that depicts refugee workers endlessly pushing against an industrial barrier, representing a kind of post-industrial neoliberal Miss of Sisyphus scene. Similarly, Huang Po Chi's production line made in China and made in Taiwan installation, which depicted the mechanisms of cheap labour involved in the garment industry by migrants in Taiwan or China. The participatory installation involved the actual production of denim garments designed by Huang but being made by volunteers, which toured between the Taipei and, Shen and Shenzhen sculpture biennials in 2014, tracing um, an actual kind of international thread of industrial migration. Such artworks raise awareness of border issues in terms of the perceivable threat from China to Taiwanese and Hong Kongese citizens. In a more active or activist approach to addressing bordered identities, some of the same artists, along with others in Taiwan, are pursuing ecologically driven collaborative projects. For example, Huang Po Chi, Xu Su Chen, Lu Ching Ming and U Ma Li have worked on farming projects with the indigenous Amis community in Taiwan, exchanging agricultural methods and planting and building crops and sustainable wooden living areas, um, which are kind of traditional skill um, called a sarwak. Independent Taiwanese curator and academic Lu Pei presented such um, eco-aesthetic eco projects in an exhibition called Micro Micro Revolution last year at Manchester Centre for um, Chinese Contemporary Art. And Lu has also written about socially engaged or participatory collaborative um, art across the Chinese Straits, considering its geo geopolitical emphasis in terms of regional place identity and ownership. She defines, quote, off-site art in Taiwan aims to bring art back into everyday life. Off-site art in Hong Kong is more like a battleground among dominant forces. 
And in mainland China, offside art is a way of gaining artistic freedom under political control, unquote. Such artistic practice is inherently functional. The artist participator actively handles the everyday land whose area, however small, is materialised into something distinct from bureaucratic endeavour. In these cases where indigenous customs are being revitalised and sustained, I suggest that this is a rupture, um, a kind of micro dissensus against the overarching Chinese system. It is a few stitches added to the searcher between the mainland with Hong Kong or Taiwan. By working with indigenous or local communities to develop and sustain practical projects, Taiwanese and Hong Kongese identity is strengthened in relation to the mainland. The border is metaphorically and potentially geopolitically tightened, creating a sense of assurance for pro-independence artists and residents. And I describe this as border practice, border praxis, sorry, where socially engaged artworks um, work towards reifying the border between two sets of geopolitical identities by a kind of border performance that is not necessarily located upon or within the physical border as was seen with Paul Jones's sort of literal performative work but which also adjoins a theoretical proposition or discussion of identity with a practical action, hence praxis, that works to corroborate it. Such practice works to enact upon or to reenact upon a border presence, albeit tangen tangentially. So borders, in terms of their preferred absence or presence, can be tackled within contemporary arts practices in performative ways, as well as or in addition to visually orient oriented modes. So picture and counterpositions. Artists and photographers' representations of the border often involve a dividing line or another form of binary visual mechanism, such as the use of a, of a diptych, as can be seen in No Sun Tag's work. So I've just kind of copied a bit of the image of the photograph of the soldiers looking out to North Korea from the observatory in the um, North Korean, the South Korean side of the DMZ. This kind of doubling of image, and also in um, Liu Xiaodong's In Between Israel and Palestine series, which was based on fieldwork done there. Um, another example can be seen with the use of opposing or monochromatic colour scenes, such as in Si Yun Lee's Endless Between Red paintings of the DMZ and of, also of North Korean landscapes which are all depicted in tones of red with areas of white connoting absence or the unobtain unobtainable, perhaps. Um, a feature about Lee Si Hyun's work in Art News said, he creates a world that functions according to logic of its own terms, defined by the very impregnability of its borders. Sometimes artists use pairings of visual signifiers, counterpositions of imagery, um, and this is the case in, also in Lee Youngback's um, Flowers and Guns in his representation of the D DMZ, which is called Angel Soldier. And it's a time-based piece with someone dressed in flowers, um, a background of flowers and a soldier slowly moving through it. So we've got this kind of um, iconic kind of contrast between the flower and the gun, which goes back to kind of photographs of um, media coverage of the, Vietnam, of the Vietnam War in the 19, late 1960s. So quite often work, artwork that's about borders looks at these, kind of uses or utilises these um, counter positions of imagery. Anthony Hawhey's Aftermath project, um, whose um, photographs juxtapose, and it's that one up there, his photographs um, juxtapose survivors of the former conflict in Ireland with its material residues, which is still present in the landscape of the border region of County Louth. These binary visual devices work to suggest the geopolitics of interior and exterior, us and them, here and there, or one another, same indifference or difference, the border is a margin between states which are endlessly deferred by their relative distance. Where migration is the focus and where diaspora is the focus, 
Sometimes this division also represents um, this kind of same binary or dichotomy between past and future, the exchange of an old turbulent life for a more democratic new one, or the boundary between a cultural or collective memory and a readjusted present. At different moments, the binary display of a visualised border that cuts a surface into two can represent all of these dichotomies around the concept of the border. Where maps are used in contemporary art practices, the borders that deline delineate geographical regions may be multiple, yet any single point along the line there is a division between two lands. And this is the nature of borders, um, as physical entities, as geobodies, as visualised constructs and discourses. So just to, just to conclude, um, that their ontology is divisive provokes both emotive and intellectual reflections around their existence. Alongside their um, accompanying capacity to be signified via a dualistic visual shorthand, Borders are ripe contexts, ripe concepts within visual culture studies for both ocular orientated manifestations and for forms of physical performativity or social engagement. Intrinsic to actual borders are a border crossing, um, an encounter that may also be a counter, a paradox, a paradox of existing then vanishing behind you. Through creative practices, this crossing can be indirectly iterated, and in turn, it can instigate a geopolitical discussion. That's it.